Thank you for joining us for the August Gate Equity Webinar, where we explore topics related to equity and graduation success. This webinar will be recorded, and we're working on our process for making our webinars ADA compliant. So stay tuned for recordings, but it may be a while. Um, the PowerPoint was emailed out to you this morning if you want to follow along. Also, we'd like to ask that you direct the questions you want us to answer into the Q&A, so please do it that way. I'm Kathy Anderson, OSPI Graduation and Equity Specialist. And today's topic is using assessment and student growth percentiles to jumpstart your year. August is a great time to think about the year to come. Data is your friend for making smart decisions about where to focus. Uh, I'm joined today by Marissa Rathbone, OSPI Director of Operations for Learning and Teaching, and David Pearscan, Math Director at Tumwater School District. We're glad y'all could be here to share your expertise. Um, all of our work at OSPI is grounded in the vision for every student to graduate from high school ready for career, college, and life. The mission of OSPI is to provide resources to schools and districts to ensure that students are successful. And we have so much cool stuff to talk about. I'm going to hand it over to Marissa Rathbone, and she's going to tell you about our agenda today. Great. Thank you so much, Kathy. So nice to be able to join you all today. Thank you for uh, coming on board and testing out Zoom with us and being interested in the assessment analytics. Uh, just before the start of a new school year. This is a great time to have this conversation. So a few things about our goals for today. Um, we want to offer some ideas to y'all about um, how to use the data to inform your planning and instruction, not just for this school year, but ongoing. We also want to show you how to access and use the equity analytics, as we refer to them. So we have a, a Tableau system that we'll be uh, reviewing and also helping to give you access to so you can navigate it on your own. Um, we'd love for you to wait to start doing that, though, until after the webinar presentation, so stick with us. We're also going to hear from David from uh, Tumwater School District, who has been using the data in an effective way to guide the school district's planning and instruction related to math in specifically. And then we're also going to learn a little bit more about tools and resources for further action and share those with you. A few, a few of our goals for today. You may have already seen this graphic previously or in other presentations that we've done. It's one of our favorite ways to display the difference between equal versus equitable. You've probably seen a couple different graphics that depict this sort of concept. Um, maybe just test out your Q&A box. Tell us uh, your initial impressions of this. What does, what does this image mean to you as you reflect on the difference between equal and equitable? What does this image say to you? Go ahead and test out your Q&A box and just put a few thoughts up. Are we seeing anything pop up yet, Kefi? No, they're thinking really deep thoughts. We were, we're really deep thoughts. <laughs> Hopefully you've had your coffee this morning or <laughs> a form of physical activity, something to get your brain moving. Looks like something mm -hmm. popped up. Ah, Kim, thank you so much. All students need the information, resources, and support to help them grow and thrive as unique individuals. Love it. Thank yeah. you, Kim. That's great. Yeah, there are lots of different ways to think about um, equal versus equitable, and we're going to continue to sort of challenge your thinking about that um, as we look at data specifically today. Looks like we had something else pop up. What did we hear? Yeah, Deborah says equal is the same for everyone. Equitable means uh, individual requirements for equitable results. Excellent. That's great. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you for giving this some thought. Our goal through uh, this webinar today is to keep you engaged. We understand that if we got to sit down with you face to face and have this conversation, it would be that much more enjoyable and engaging. But to whatever degree we can keep you engaged through the webinar, um, we'll be continuing to ask you to reflect, uh, give feedback, and answer some questions throughout. So um, be ready and uh, look forward to the conversation. Thanks for your input. We'll revisit this image at the end of the presentation. So a little bit, of the, there are 12 performance indicators that we could be discussing today, but for today's purpose, we're going to be thinking about and looking at uh, the assessment analytics most specifically, as well as uh, the student growth percentiles, um, looking at proficiency. So you may have joined for previous presentations on graduation, attendance, discipline. All of these are critically important, and um, we, we did do some presentations last year on assessment, uh, but just now are getting to having 
conversations with actual school districts. So we're really excited about what we're going to learn, not just from David, but also from some of the other school districts that are showing uh, some really great outcomes as it relates to math, ELA, and science. We, of course, want to always keep in mind um, that our students need to be in school and supported through their transitions, um, and we want to help students to avoid ninth grade course failure, uh, suspensions and expulsions, and chronic absenteeism. We know that that's one way of measuring success, and there are so many ways. We also talk a lot about proficiency. So I think it's important when we talk about proficiency to define what it means in terms of our assessment analytics as well as what it means more comprehensively. So different ways to consider what proficiency means. So how is a student proficient? Yes, today we're going to be talking about their performance on state assessments, but it's also important to think about um, on track to graduate as well as their demonstration of success in a variety of areas. So we recognize that uh, data is limited in how it's evaluating student success, but it's one way to take the temperature on um, their, uh, their performance as well as how well they're doing in school. So we recognize the importance of having a comprehensive, thoughtful, whole child approach to this effort. And today we're going to be looking at one of those measures as it relates to state assessments. So again, um, some of the data that we're going to explore and be talking about, including from our presenter David today, um, is how we're growing towards proficiency in ELA and math um, through student growth percentiles, as well as meeting standards on the third, eighth, and uh, now it will be the 10th grade uh, ELA and math assessments. It was previously 11th, and there was a recent shift in the legislature, so moving forward that will reflect 10th, but currently the data that we have is for 11th. So some of the state assessment data points that you will find in Tableau, the uh, equity analytics that we'll be exploring later on in this presentation are related to smarter balanced assessments, the SBAs. Again, um, currently the data that we have is math and ELA grades three through eighth and then 11th. In the future, it will be 10th. Um, and of course, exams for math uh, and biology and measurement of student progress, MSP for science, fifth and eighth. And all of this data is still included in the Tableau as it's data that we've previously connect collected. So before we start to explore the data uh, itself and give you some access and exploration, we want to hear um, from a school district that's shown marked um, improvements as well as um, some real highlights in terms of the outcomes that they're showing for math, but even more importantly, how they're taking the data that's showing that they're doing well already, but really digging in deeper to find out what it is they're doing well, how it is they could improve, and asking themselves some really important questions. And um, we've only had one conversation with David previously, but it was uh, really delightful. We learned a lot from him and thought it would be a nice opportunity to shine a light on how one school district is using data to inform their practices. So um, David, uh, are, are you on? Can we hear you? Yep, I'm here. Wonderful. Yay, technology working already. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you so much for joining us, David, uh, especially since uh, it's not quite the school year. You're still a little bit on summer break, so really appreciate you joining us today and spending some time. Um, we did uh, incorporate some of the slides that you sent us today, so you just let me know when you want me to advance to the next one, um, and uh, feel free to take it from here. Okay. Thank you for having me. So um, I just want to share a little bit about some of the journey that we've been going on. Um, in Tumwater and how we've been trying to use some assessment data to both inform some of the decisions that we're making and also inform um, our practices and seeing what's working and kind of what's not working and um, how we can leverage the data that we have to kind of make some sy systemic changes that we're trying to um, trying to make as we try and get all students to the success that we're trying to do specifically around mathematics because that's the role that I kind of have to play in the district. So if we go to the next slide, um, you can see uh, kind of the, the data that we were using uh, to, to drive our focus is kind of this progression of, uh, we looked at our areas of need, we saw that we had um, some ninth grade failure rates in our math classes that we were looking to improve. So 
um, that was kind of our, our first initial reaction as we saw just kind of data from our teachers of we had this problem where, uh, we have, where we felt there were too many ninth graders that were not being successful in their, in their math class. So then um, in light of that data, we looked at, okay, let's look at our eighth, ninth grade transition. What's happening there? Um, do we want to address the need at our high schools or do we want to focus our, our, um, our kind of our focus in, in eighth grade? Um, so we decided that the middle school would be where we wanted to focus on um, just because we had some, um, some people in place there that were excited about trying something new um, and that we wanted to try and get some success um, in our middle schools and trying to look at our eighth grade math assessment data. Um, and when we dug in a little bit deeper in there, we saw, okay, if we look at our eighth grade, we have uh, an opportunity gap that we would like to address, specifically with our non-low income versus our, our low income students. Um, we, we looked at the student growth percentiles of, of that, and we were also looking at our, our smart balance scores and looking at their claim one, two, three, and four for the math assessment and looking at that there was an area that we could focus on. And even when we dug in a little bit deeper into the data more, we saw, okay, what we have is we have a core instructional focus that we want to work on for the year. And that's kind of the, that was kind of the progression that we went through of all the data kind of made to this next step of ending up in, we want to focus our core instruction in our in the eighth grade year as we try and prepare kids for high school. Um, so then if we go to the next slide, Um, and in light of the instructional focus that we had, seeing that we had this gap between our, our low income and non low income, we targeted our eighth grade um, students. We focused on some of the high leverage teaching practices that are supported by OSPI and my research says. And um, we really, really looked at what our instruction was going to be that could reach kind of all those students, um, specifically the, the low income and non-low income. And we were able to come back at the end of the year in our assessment results and see, okay, how were, how were the efforts that we put in for the year, how were they um, successful or not successful? And, and in, in looking at our eighth grade assessment data, we were able to see where we were targeting our focus in those classrooms, that there was a significant reduced opportunity gap and because of, because of the success that we had in this one targeted eighth grade um, in our middle school, it excited everybody. So we used that assessment data to kind of drive the change in our, um, both in our middle schools, but also in our high school classrooms as well as, wow, when we focus our efforts on these high level teaching practices for mathematics in our core instruction, um, it does have a strong effect and it's reaching more kids and the, the opportunity gap is decreasing. So now um, we didn't have to try and sell change to the teachers. They were, they were excited about trying this, trying some new things because they saw that it was having some strong successes. And that's what is kind of driving this systemic core instructional focus for our district now is they've seen the success from the data and, um, we're getting um, almost all of our teachers on board and excited about um, trying some new things. One of my favorite things, David, about uh, this slide and your comments are you're using uh, the term data and excited in the same sentence. So, <laughs> right, yeah. uh, this, is, well, this is definitely something we want to spread. So Right. And, and we're, we're math people, so... We're, well, that's I true. Can't, <laughs> but, I, can't, I can't speak to what would happen if you did the same thing with ELA teachers. But. Sure. Well, you know, <laughs> excitement, enthusiasm can spread. That's for sure. Right. So yeah. Thanks for getting us started. Um, yeah. Next slide. Yeah. Okay. So then I just wanted to speak to you a little bit about, so data, what data was, I mean, there's a lot out there. So what we found was the most impactful for our, for our teachers and then getting them excited for the student growth percentile comparisons, we were able to actually show like we have we have our non-low income and we have our low income students able to see what what it looked like before and what it looked like after we had focused on some instruction with our eighth grade um, classrooms. Mm -hmm. uh, that was that was very impactful for teachers. Like 
um, I can't I can't speak enough to like just the excitement that they saw when they when they saw how how the efforts that they put into really had an effect on the students, and then also the claim reports from Smarter Balance, the claims one, two, and four, and then those three um, reports from um, Smarter Balance, and really I think why that those ones were the most impactful is because those were the assessment mechanisms that we kept telling teachers that were going to have an effect of. If we focus on our instruction, students are understand mathematics in more deeper ways, and their their scores on the smart balance are going to improve. They're going to be able to show that they understand the mathematics. And then, if uh, also with our instructional practices, they were were working on those equitable teaching practices, and were, we were reaching not just our non-low income students, but we we're reaching all of our students. So we saw those the student growth percentiles. Um, we were able to compare the non-low income versus low income. We, we were talking about having equitable instructional practices and we were getting more equitable results. So I think the data was just um, the state mechanisms that were already in place that were reflecting those focus areas that we were working on. That's great, David. Is, was that the final slide? That was, yeah. Okay. Um, so I think it would be great if some of the folks who are joining us uh, remotely could go ahead and submit some questions to ask you, which we will uh, be able to reflect. I, I think mm -hmm. I saw, did somebody already submit a question perhaps? Just a comment. Oh, just a comment. Mm -hmm. um, so that's mm -hmm. good. So if you have a question for David um, about the work that they're doing in Tumwater, uh, about the way in which they're using the assessment to really like you said, target your um, instructional practices and high leverage teaching practices would invite questions from the audience uh, for David to answer. While we're waiting for um, some other questions to come in, um, one, one of the things we talked about, David, was um, you're working specifically with the math group. Are you familiar if, if the ELA or any other groups of educators in your school system are doing similar work in other content areas? So I, I know that the, um, the ER, ELA, our ELA teachers also are working with um, assessment data. I can't speak specifically to what they're doing with it, but sure. that they are looking at um, the smaller balance scores and how they're doing. Um, but I can't speak them to a, a lot of detail around that. Okay, mm -hmm. that's good. But it, it does it is helpful to know that this is this practice is happening with other content areas beyond. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how did you guys share this with your district? Like, did you look at the numbers specifically and ask to show it off in a staff meeting? Or how, what was your process like in just communicating the work that needed to be done? So we have, um, at the beginning of the school year, we have, a, like, it's called Tumwater U, which is where teachers have opportunities to go to different sessions. So we have a, our math teachers typically come together and we are able to look at some of our data and see what our what's going to be our focus area for the year. So that's where we're, we gather the math teachers together and we can show them. And this is kind of the, the results from our small, smaller balance and this is going to be our focus area for the year. Um, and then we also have our, we have PLCs um, built into our, our, our schedule. So we're able to work with our math PLCs like as ongoing conversation throughout the year of how we're supporting them with um, what our focus areas are and, and looking at the smaller grain size data with like our formative assessments and interim assessments and stuff. Great. Looks like we had a couple questions pop up. We do. Um, what teaching practices did you focus on? You mentioned some high leverage teaching methods. Were there any that um, were sp like specifically valuable for you guys? So um, kind of our, our vision with our, with our um, teaching practices is that our um, that student thinking is driving the instructional moves in the classroom. So we're giving, trying to give students more of a voice into what they think about the mathematics first before we start telling them how to think. Because um, we know that when we have a room full of, of 30 students in our classes, there's a variety of different needs. It like, goes back to that picture of the equal versus equitable. If we give everyone the same instruction, then that's not necessarily going to meet their needs. So it's, it's about getting a window into their thinking first and then delivering instruction in light of what is actually going on in their minds first. So that's really the, the big focus area is how do we get, how do we make student thinking visible and then how do we respond to that thinking once it's kind of, once it's out there. And that's the fun part for us. <laughs> 
Yeah, that's great. I love I love the use of the word visible. Um, I think if, if we're focusing on making sure that all of our students feel seen, um, right. it just it creates such a, a warmer, more welcoming and inclusive learning environment for them. Uh, it's not just good for teachers, but it's good for the students. Mm -hmm. Right. And as far as the like the student growth percentiles, like were you saying like one group, like was that a district focus to focus in on low income students specifically? It was kind of like it was kind of a joint decision of um, with our middle schools. And when we looked into the data, we just did some some notice and wonder protocols of like when you when you look at the data, what are you noticing? What does it make you wonder about? Um, and that was that was for us, that was the major like subgroup comparison that uh, we had was the, the low income versus the non low income. And did that data, did that come from your superintendent? What was your leadership's role in that drive? Um, so I, as I'm the, like, the math specialist for the district, so I am the one that kind of goes into the math data and I, I dig around in there first to kind of see what's there and then, uh, when we gather teachers together, I'm able to pre present the data to to the teachers and show them kind of what's what's there. What are we noticing? That's awesome. That's great. Amazing. Um, we did have another question. Um, how did you get common understanding of student growth percentiles, or were people pretty much up to speed? Um, so people weren't really up to speed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, Again, like so, I as I'm the I kind of work with all the math teachers. So just in conversations during PLC time, we're able to talk about this. Is the, these are the different uh, data options that are out there that we can look at, and specifically, but that was one that I was excited about was the student growth percentile. So that was one that I was able to share with teachers um, during their PLC time, and then during their um, our our Tom What Are You little mini sessions that we have before the school year starts. But I did take some kind of background work so they understood like what they're looking at and what it means. Mm -hmm. um, was there a specific training that you provided for the teaching practices? Um, what role did you play in supporting those teachers across the year? Yeah, so we've we've had some pretty intensive uh, professional development around what what teaching routines, what kind of teacher habits are going to support students. Um, so we had. Uh, what we call there were studio days. We're able to um, up with our eighth grade. So we had our eighth grade teacher was like a studio teacher. So they were the one that was just deprivatizing their practice. Um, mm -hmm. I would do lesson planning with that teacher. Then other teachers would come in and observe the lesson and we're able to debrief kind of how our students responding to some of the things, these things that we were trying out. So it's very um, getting teachers to be reflective about their practice and uh, be open to um, feedback from from each other and this idea that we're all kind of growing together as we're trying to reach more kids so we could get those equitable outcomes that we're, we're looking for. Um, and my role as the math specialist, I get to come alongside teachers and learn with them and, and just try new things out together as the instructional coach. Seems like you're um, really breaking down barriers, David, and and a lot of times people are afraid of data, um, and it, it just feels really accessible the way that you're explaining it, which might contribute to one of the reasons why uh, your team is excited about it. Um, so instead of it being something to be afraid of, it sounds like it's something that you can lean into and use to support your work, um, not not to be against your work. Is that sort of the a philosophy that seems like it resonates with your team? It does, yeah. So the I think the reason why they're excited about the data is because it helped us identify what we wanted to focus on. Like we, we knew we wanted to focus on something. The data helped us in the form of that. And then it was also able to pro provide some pretty positive feedback for the, the efforts that we're putting into to growing as teachers was, was having a positive effect on our kids. So it wasn't something that was, was scary or, or something that we wanted to shy away from. We really did just kind of lean into it as as one of the things that we could look to to inform um, our decisions. That's great. Um, we have another question. Are you using habits of mind work through uh, TDG? So we have we have used some some work with uh, teachers development group and looking at 
have habits of mind and how students reason about the math, yeah. You said, um, I wasn't familiar with that acronym, you said Teacher Development Group? Yes, yeah. Okay. Hmm. That's a good um, resource for us potentially to, to share with others, yes? Mm -hmm. Cool. Great. Um, looks like we've, um, we've shared with you all the questions that have come through from the rest of our audience. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with us before we um, get everybody excited about accessing the data on their own? Um, I guess just that our, I mean, our journey is not over. Like we are now looking at, now that we've had some positive effects with eighth grade, so now what are we going to be able to do for some of our, since we focused on core instruction, like what are we going to do for our interventions at our middle school and also like for our high school too. So this is not a like journey that is complete. We're just continually going to go back to the data and see where, where are our opportunities for growth. That's great. Yeah, to see to see how it can impact your work over time. Yeah. Um, if if there was a school district that hadn't yet started a journey such as this, any advice that you might give them as they as they get started? Um, I think for us, the reason why we were able to have some success is that we were able to find an area that we we thought that we could have some pretty quick positive results in, and get. Um, a few teachers excited, and then that would then in turn get more teachers excited. So that was that was kind of that was intentional on our part and why we were focused on what we did. So that would be a suggestion that that I might have for for some people. Great, that's that's helpful. Um, and then, how did you monitor that? Or how did you monitor like your, your success? Like your you, success. you're talking about like short periods of time. Yeah. So so we just thought that. Um, well, so with, in focusing on the teaching practices, we were able to have like those, those studio days throughout the year, which um, was formative assessment as we went. But also, um, we were pretty, we had some teachers who we thought that were going to be really excited, and we had a new teacher who was really excited about the work. So it wasn't like we were going against the grain with, with people, like they were excited about joining in. So we, we we were anticipating having some positive results because of the excitement from the, the group that we had picked to work with initially. And for your studio days, the, for just like from a technical point of view, did you have your strongest teachers like presenting in this new way or did everybody take a turn or how did you? There was, there was yeah. one studio teacher who was a brand new teacher who was just excited about learning and growing. So. <laughs> Wow. It wasn't necessarily our strongest teacher, or just someone who was really passionate about kids and, and growing in their practice. That's pretty amazing. How empowering to have right. yeah. teachers like, <laughs> to support you, especially if you're brand new. That's great. And, and kudos to um, Ann Gallagher, who's the director of mathematics here at OSPI. Um, uh, for for knowing you and connecting us. I'm so pleased to be able to have this conversation with you. Um, be careful though, since you said yes to us this time, um, <laughs> the, hopefully this is the start of a, of a long-lasting relationship and that we're able to get more school districts to join in on this, um, on this journey with us and I really appreciate you getting us started um, and hopefully you've generated some excitement with our audience and they're excited to now dig into the tableau. Um, unless you have any additional comments, we might move on and, and dig into the data. Anything um, else you'd yeah. like to share, David? No, I'm good, yeah. Great. Thank, Thank you, you so much for being with us today and for sharing your success and uh, look forward to learning more from you as you continue the journey as you described it. Thank you. Thanks, David. Well, so now that you've heard from a school district who um, has accessed the data and used it to help uh, with their own district improvements, perhaps you're a little bit more excited about um, diving in yourself. So let's continue this conversation about how can you utilize the data dashboard. Um, feel free as we're having these conversations, we're gonna pose some questions and as we sort of pose the questions, it's great that you have this PowerPoint presentation because we'd like for you to continue to use these questions to sort of guide your thinking as you move forward. Um, and also feel free to respond to the questions in the Q&A too and, and 
those questions that you share, the answers or responses that you share with us, we'd love to be able to share with the rest of the group. So um, there are so many ways that you can use data to inform your practices. Um, we won't have time to go into those deeply, but definitely for you to be considering as we work through these systems. So we do have a, a question in polling um, for you to answer. Are you currently using proficiency data in your work? Um, and this is a little bit different here. Do you, how do you want people to answer? Do you want people just to put an A, B, C, or D? I think they just click. Oh, they just click. Oh, look at that. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize that Zoom could do that. So go ahead and um, respond um, if you're current, you, how you're currently using data in your work. Mm -hmm. Are you an extensively person, Marissa? Ex yes, extensively, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Me too. Yes, extensively. I know. So much data. It's excellent to have access to that. Kepi can put together an Excel spreadsheet downloading data from Tableau like a champ. I have become very versed in Excel. Yes. It's quite the journey. Yes, quite the journey. These are our <laughs> words. Excited <laughs> and journey are the words of the day. Words of the day. All right, let's um, end polling. Okay, what did we find out? Um, we'll share the results. Oh, look at that. You can see it. Hooray. I love this Zoom system. Mm -hmm. All right, so it looks like most of the folks who are joining us, and I think there are 18 people on, including ourselves, mm -hmm. um, uh, most of you are using data in some way. So um, maybe not extensively, but at least sometimes. So that's great. So the conversation that we're having is not foreign to you, um, but perhaps it will help take you to the next level. So great, thank you for participating. We've got a few more polls throughout the rest of the presentation. Helpful for us to know. So let's access the data, shall we? Um, a little bit about Tableau. So um, there, the report card is still available to you in that previous way of looking at data, but we've moved to Tableau so that the data can be a little bit more dynamic in the way that you're looking at it. Tableau itself, we've been using that term a lot, is um, basically a software tool that we've used to help you access and see your data in a new way. It's um, you know, similar to Excel in the way that you can uh, do graphs and charts, but there's more flexibility. And it's really great because Tableau works across PCs and Apple devices, Macs and PCs. So it works better than previous systems that we used across different platforms and devices, which was one of the other reasons for the move to Tableau. You're getting sort of a sample of a screenshot here um, from the Tableau, and we're actually gonna go there and, and look at it in a more dynamic way. Um, when we're talking about the assessment analytics, which when you go into Tableau is referred to as proficiency, so we're saying assessment proficiency uh, essentially the same as we're using it synonymously um, in Tableau. What you're able to look at when you go into Tableau is comparisons. You're, you're able to look at the assessment or proficiency analytics by school, district, ESD, uh, student subgroups, and you can also look at multiple years. So this just is, again, a, a more dynamic way of looking at the data that allows you to um, sort of manipulate it. You can't break the system. That's what's so cool about it. You can go in there and click on all the buttons and you're not gonna break it. So um, we really encourage you uh, as we move ahead with this presentation and after to get in there and really just explore and play and see what's in there. I'm learning new things about it all the time as I do that. So I'm like, oh, I didn't realize I could look at the data in this way and this chart is really helpful. So again, just an opportunity for you to be curious about what's in there and how to look at the data. So really important question is who is included in the data and who is not? So again, What's included in the data are school districts, buildings, and students in Washington State, specifically. What's not included um, are districts with fewer than 10 students. So uh, at buildings and districts, as you look at the data at the building or district level, you're not going to see, you will not see yourself if there are 10 students or less um, in that district or in that school. And that's, again, to, um, to maintain um, I, uh, privacy and not publish identifiable information. But that's, that data is still available to you through the EDS system and um, school districts have access to their own. So we might not be able to see those districts if they're not ourselves, but you do have access to your own data. So why is it uh, important to report assessment data in this way? 
we really we talk a lot here about how data is a catalyst for conversation and um, to be used that way is really exciting because again oftentimes in the past we've thought of data as being a, a way to shame or punish or look at things that are bad um, but we really want to sort of turn that thinking on its head and instead invite conversations about what's working as it relates to teaching and learning and instruction. And just, again, I'm gonna use the term curious just to get really curious about what the data does and doesn't say. Um, it's a really user-friendly way to identify disparities between student groups. Again, not to say, well, you're not doing it right, but actually to look at what's going well in some school districts and to figure out how we can replicate those practices in our own. Uh, we also want to expand conversations that focus um, on proficiency to include student growth. So it's not just about what's happening in the moment, but what's happening over time. Again, going back to what David said, that looking at data is really a journey. Um, looking at one year or one student group is, is good. You can get a lot of information from that, but more importantly, that you're looking at it over time to see where there's growth, um, maybe where there's not growth, and, and making adjustments as, as you look at data over time is really valuable. And again, we, we really are trying to help school districts uh, shine a light on what is working well. So again, that, that, that we turn on its head this, this concept that data is a way to, to shame or punish, but more importantly, that it's really about highlighting what's going well so that we can replicate those practices in our own buildings, districts, and also at the state level. So why don't we go to the data dashboard? Um, this should be a live link, hoping that that works, and it does. So uh, essentially what I did was just go to the main page of OSPI. Um, so if you're, um, if you're joining us and you have a computer accessible and you wanna sort of explore with us, please feel free. Uh, this is the, the main page of OSPI, which is www.k12.wa.us, our main page. Lots of really great information on here. We're just going to focus on one button, though. It's this one right here that says K-12 Data and Reports. Go ahead and click on that green button with the pie chart. Um, again, lots of different places you can click here, but we're going to go specifically to OSPI Performance Indicators. And this, this particular page is rich with a lot of information, and I would encourage you to come back and explore all of the links that are available to you. Um, but for now, we're going to focus specifically on the English Language Arts, Math, and Science Assessment Performance Indicator. Um, and that's going to take us to um, the data that we're going to start exploring. But as you can see, anything with a live link has data associated with it um, that has been loaded into Tableau, and you can explore that on your own. So this goes down to um, uh, the assessment, and we're going to actually go to the data files for Tableau. If you want to come back, you'll notice that we have done presentations in the past that are recorded. Um, there's also some tutorials about how to use the Tableau system itself in the case that we're moving too fast and you need a refresher on how to move through it. But we're going to click here on data files. And so even though it, it's still the OSPI website, this is uh, Tableau, has, is what you're looking at is the Tableau system populated on the OSPI website. So a few things about these tabs. These are the business rules, again, reiterating sort of what we just talked about in the previous slides, what you're actually looking at, who is in this data, who is not in this data, um, and how we've um, maintained some level of privacy for those schools that have 10 or less students. The table of contents is really helpful, I think, as you look at the tabs going across the top. The reason why is it basically gives you an overview of what each tab contains. So if you look here, it says P, District Overview. The P stands for proficiency. And if you look at the first tab as you go from left to right, P district overview, P district overview. If I click here, it's going to take me to that tab. It also gives you um, a graphic chart of what you would be looking at. So this table of contents is really helpful because it reminds you what you'll be looking at if you go to that particular tab and gives you an example of what the charts will look like once you start looking at the data. So I'm gonna click on P-District Overview because it's the first one. 
so proficiency district overview. And because we've been talking about math, I'm going to leave it on math, but if you click here, you can see that um, there are quite a few different assessments that you can take a look at. So we're keeping it um, at Smarter Balance Assessments for Math. Um, Again, over here, you can do it by year. I'm going to leave it on the most recent collection of data that we have, which is the 2015-16 school year. Uh, and then by student group. So let's, um, let's leave it at all students for now, and then uh, maybe we'll take a look at low income here in a moment. And um, let's go to eighth grade, actually. How about we? Mm -hmm. And if you have any suggestions about how you want me to move right. the data around, Kathy, just great. let me know. So what you're looking at is all the school districts with more than 10 students um, listed on this chart. If you just uh, hover over one, it will highlight the school, the number of students, uh, the percentage that met the standard, and then the state, um, the state average, which this is the, the bar right here. So when we're talking about the year 2015-16, the uh, SBA math average was 74 uh, 47.8, sorry, 47.8 was the state average. So that's your red line here showing the middle. Um, any of these school districts up here um, are, for all of their students, performed at above the state average for that school year in eighth grade SBA math. So if you hover over one, let's go up here, Bellevue has a uh, little over 1,500 students. Uh, they, they had their students in eighth grade for math at 77.4%, um, which is significantly over the state average by 30%. So one way to look at that data. If, um, if you, so you can do it that way. And if you just wanted to click on one, it would allow you just to have, this is University Place, and it would highlight it down here in the map, its actual graphic location. Oops, is that right? Maybe you clicked on Shoreline. Oh, did I click on Shoreline? Yeah. Aha, I did. So that is Shoreline. Um, and then it shows it here on the map, uh, similar information. And then it would also, as if you hover down in alphabetical order, highlight it here on this chart. You can also draw a box, can't you, over Oh, yeah, you can. That That's a good point. I forgot mm -hmm. that you could do that. So if I wanted to go like that, it would um, allow me to sort of capture some of the um, more positive outliers in this particular area, and it would highlight them on the map, and it would also highlight them on this chart. And that's such a cool feature if you want to find someone close to you who's doing well and just ask them the question. Oh, that's like, a great what idea. What are you doing? And right, that's great. Yeah. So if you're if you're over here in this area and you see that this is the closest school district to you, it happens to be Mead. Um, find out who your job alikes are over in Mead and start asking them some questions about. Hey, did you know? <laughs> one one question to ask is, <laughs> did you even know that your uh, test scores are better than the state average? They might not even realize it. And um, if they do or they don't, it's nice to start having a conversation or asking questions about what they're doing to, to be achieving at this level. So um, that's a little bit, of the, so that's looking at um, all students, but if you wanted to narrow down, we, we tend to look at the um, low income, mm -hmm. most specifically, because it's sort of the biggest breadth of, of students who may potentially be graduating um, at lower possible rates than the rest of the state average, and we want to close that gap. So um, if you do the same thing here that you did last time, highlight, mm -hmm. you may see. And you can hit keep only if you want them to get big. Oh, show me how to do that. You know how to do it? No, here, one should so go and drive. You can go like that, and then, uh, oh, wait a second. That. And then it says keep only. And it'll oh, blow them up nice. so you can see them a little bit better. Nice. Mm -hmm. A little bit easier to hover over and, and mm -hmm. click on it. So if you were looking at your own school district's data and showed um, maybe you, you uh, have a significant gap between your low income and your non low income students, and you want to find out how school districts are specifically addressing the needs of their low income students to close the gap this would be a great uh, a great place to start. Mm -hmm. And uh, Susan Kanega is telling us that uh, the updates for this are actually going to come out for the next school year in September or October. So stay tuned for that. That's great. Yeah. Good to know. Yeah. The new stuff is coming. The new stuff is coming. Other ways that you um, think you we should show? I was thinking, let's 
see. That's the ESD view. I was thinking we should show them a school over here. Okay, great. Or yeah, by group, maybe. Yeah, that's great. So thinking about all of those student groups, I mean, David was talking about how they're using um, data to look at how are their low-income students doing. So you can also do that here. So student group, if you select that, it'll give you these comparisons to kind of see how your group is doing versus your non-group and also your trend over time. And that's a pretty cool tool just to see how you're doing for progress and it's such a great thing to share with your staff. Absolutely. It's just so motivating to see growth and also um, what you want to work on. Right. Yeah, looking at it in both ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so again, we only have 10 minutes left and some other slides yeah. to get through. Um, it, we never have enough time to actually go through all of the tabs. <laughs> so uh, again, all of that is available to you in many different performance indicator areas and would def just definitely invite you to go in there and start playing. If you could put that playing on pause, even if you are excited about it right now, we've just got a few things that we'd like to um, put in front of you before um, ending for the day. So this, this information is actually helpful to us as we navigate how to help sort of inform using this data. So if you could ask, answer the question, how do you feel about using the analytics to better understand equity in your assessment scores? I'm curious uh, what your response might be. So go ahead and, and weigh in. We've got a knowledgeable crowd. A knowledgeable crowd. We can find places where their district has work to do. That's great. Way to go, everybody. Yeah, I mean, none of us are perfect, right? Yeah. <laughs> Tony says that he might be perfect. That's pretty close to true, actually. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> great. Good. So that's important to, to reflect upon uh, the fact that the data, again, tells you tells you what you're doing well, um, or, or is an opportunity to start asking questions so you can find out what you, you or other districts are doing well, with always an opportunity to improve upon our practices, which again goes back to David's comment about this being a journey, is that we asked David, because their data is showing some significant um, improvement as well as performance above the state average. So they obviously are doing some things well, but they're not saying, okay, well, we're done. We don't have any more work to do. They're like, okay, we, we may be doing things well, but there's plenty of opportunity for us to be doing better. So well, the important. cool thing about David's work is they're starting in like a small place. So they kind of mm -hmm. ran a pilot and then from that they're scaling up. So right. That's, that's such great. a great model. Yeah. Just taking, taking it off in bite-sized pieces. That's great. Good modeling. All right, thanks for doing that poll. Trying to move on to the next slide, but it seems, oh, there it is. So, um, not gonna spend too long on this because we took a little time with it, but again, just remembering that there there is a difference between equal and equitable and continuing to ask your, yourselves what that means. Um, and, and also asking in what ways your district provides equitable experiences and instruction to your students. Using data is one way to inform that. Um, and, and specifically how it relates to assessment. So again, you have this PowerPoint in front of you and this might be, if you haven't started this conversation with your school districts yet, or even with the teachers that you work with, some of the information tools and questions that we've provided in this, in this presentation is a good place to start. I don't think there's a right or wrong place to start, um, just the point that you get started. So some, um, some guiding reflection questions. So, when you move forward, either uh, individually or I would encourage you to join with some of your colleagues in reviewing the data, sit together in front of a computer. Um, it's, Kepi and I just did it again mm -hmm. today. It's, we've probably done that several times, just navigating what the Tableau system does, and start to ask yourself and one another the questions, how do your student subgroups, uh, the, those populations compare to others? What trends are you noticing from one school year to the next school year? How do you compare to similar districts? Again, we're, we're always so afraid to use that comparison word. It's not a way to say, ooh, I'm better than everybody else, or ooh, I'm so much worse than everybody else. It's not a shame game. It is a, how do I compare it as a way to evaluate what could you be doing well, um, what are you already doing well, and who you might want to ask about what they're doing differently than you. 
And then using some of the key performance indicators, ninth grade course failure, chronic absenteeism, maybe discipline. Um, are there any crossover issues? Are you seeing as you're looking at different data sets um, that you have some consistencies in subgroups? Perhaps you have certain subgroups who are performing uh, consistently well in different um, assessment or performance indicator areas or consistently poorly. Um, and, and again, just getting really curious about what that might mean and starting to ask those questions. So this is sort of a good way to start the conversation. What about your district and some guiding uh, questions? With a word of caution. <laughs> So oftentimes when we start looking at data, um, you find some facts, and then you make some assumptions about what those facts mean. And then you speculate uh, what you should do next, and then you just do it. Um, and so we want to help you stick with the facts. Um, and it's okay to make some assumptions, but also ask some questions behind that and really find out what's going on behind it. So just as an example, you might find a fact that 70% of your 10th graders scored below proficient on the statewide math assessment. So you might automatically jump to, mm, we obviously don't have the right focus in our 10th grade math curriculum. That may be true, but it's definitely an assumption that's not totally informed. Lots of questions to ask before you get to that point. The danger of automatically going to that assumption is that you speculate, oh, maybe we should just revamp our 10th grade math curriculum. That seems like an obvious uh, next step to do, and then you revamp the 10th grade math curriculum. The thing about it is it might, that might not have been the foundational problem that caused the 70% of your 10th graders uh, to score below proficient. So there are lots of questions to be asking in between your facts and some of the assumptions uh, that you make. So take time after you find the facts to really start asking the questions that will help you get to the bottom of, of the cause. And most likely the root cause isn't just one thing, it's many things. So um, thanks to um, work already done in this building uh, around graduation rates by Dixie and attendance by Chrissy. Um, some consistencies that they found from the districts who are positive outliers, I think this is just important to note um, as we continue to explore the data, is that some of the school districts that are showing positive results in graduation and attendance most specifically have a couple elements in place at the district level. Uh, and, and what the findings were um, were that there was transform transformational leadership going on. Uh, there was a level of collaborative inquiry. Again, uh, David's school district modeling this very much, like just getting really curious about not just the data, but, uh, but about their practices. But there's a tiered system of support, so they, they are looking at ways in which to support students that's not solely instructional, and they're using the data to inform their, um, their practices. Yeah, Anything else exactly. in your findings? Yeah, because yeah. Kefi's been able to interview some more school districts than I have. So mm -hmm. um, anything else to add to some of those essential elements? Well, with that transformational leadership, just thinking about those leadership teams and how they can really bolster the continuation of that great work, even if people leave. So sometimes you have a really great administrator, but then they leave and the work is lost. And so it's right. great to share that, um, that leadership piece with strong people in the school and making sure that that work is on into the future. That's great. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So we still have lots to learn. Um, we may find that there are other essential elements that exist in, in school districts as we look at other data, uh, but these seem to be some real consistent uh, elements that we're seeing in the school districts who are doing really well. Something to note. So um, we're, we're at 11 o'clock or close to it, so we, we might not have time to go through all the slides, but I think this is a good one to end on because, again, it's like really getting curious about what the data is telling us and, and trying not to jump immediately to assumptions. So when you're looking at your data, what, what did the results make you wonder? Um, what factors are affecting your student performance and how can your district impact those factors? Most importantly, what can you do um, in conversations about these data is just starting the conversation. And what do you want to learn from other districts that are getting better results? And lastly, how can you use these new ways of looking at data to inform your district's effort to improve equity? We talk a lot about equity here, and, and what we want is to make sure that students are coming to school with every opportunity possible um, to graduate uh, career, college, and life ready. Um, 
so you know there there are lots of questions that we've we've put in front of you that you might want to ask yourself and um, most importantly is is just the the desire to learn um, and we don't assume to have all of the answers or any of the answers to these questions because they probably are unique to your school district so again just leaving you wanting to to be curious about the data and maybe even a little bit excited Here's some great resources, and those will be in that PowerPoint that we're going to resend out to the group. And um, we do have contact information in there as well. So Marissa's on there, as well as Susan Kanega and Dixie Grinnenfelder and Ashley Colburn for data. Um, next month, we're going to um, be focusing in on predicting graduation with early warning indicators. That's going to be September 13th, um, so 10 to 11 a.m. And if you would help us out, um, we are wondering what questions you have that you want answered on our series and if you have anything specific that we can answer for you next month about early warning indicators, we would love to incorporate that into our show. Is there anything we can do to make Gate Webinar better? Please share your ideas with us. That's how we grow. So um, thanks so much for joining us. Our, uh, our images are all Creative Commons licensed. So that is a point of growth for us. Yay! Yay! Creative Commons. We're so. such good rule followers. That's right. Yeah. Um, so join us next month. Thanks, Thanks so much, everybody. Get curious and excited. And thank you, David. You're great. <laughs>